What is going on guys? Welcome back to the channel Cell Med and today we have episode number two of the MedView series where we'll be speaking with student doctor Samin Rahman who is a third year medical student at the NYIT College of Osteopathic Medicine in New York. So just for a general introduction, Samin Rahman is a third year medical student at the NYIT College of Osteopathic Medicine. He is from Roslyn, New York, not far from his school campus. He attended Stony Brook University where he pursued a degree in biology which he received in 2018. His primary interest is in providing medical care to underserved areas abroad, as well as healthcare education to Bangladeshis. In the summer of 2019, he spent some time assisting medical personnel in the Rohingya refugee camp in Cox's Bajar, Bangladesh. As an undergraduate, he spent two years working in a lab studying the effects of deep brain stimulation on outcomes in motor neuron disorders. He is currently on his third year rotations and hopes to improve his clinical knowledge and hands-on skills in order to pursue a residency in either internal medicine or emergency medicine. So without further ado, let's go ahead and hop straight into the interview. Hey, Salam Kusamin, how are you doing today? Thanks for being on the channel, man. Welcome, Salam. Thanks for having me. Huge honor. Is there anything in your bio that I mentioned that you wanted to add or want to emphasize or anything that I missed that you want to say right now? Uh, no, it was perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So usually the first question that I ask is why the field of medicine? Now, if you look at the field of healthcare, just in general, you know, there's many specialties that you can go into to help people and be an integral part of the healthcare system. So why specifically did you want to choose medicine? You know, for me, a, a big thing was when I was choosing, you know, when I was thinking about a career when I was younger, um, a big part of it was what's something that I can do for the rest of my life. And for me, I didn't want to necessarily do something that was a field where only I was benefiting from it. You know what I mean? Like, like I wanted to work with other people and be able to, you know, reach out to other people and connect with people and, and help them. Um, and, it, you know, there are people in my family who are in the medical field and that definitely played a part in it. But ultimately the thing that, that pushed me to it was actually seeing, seeing, um, my parents in in action in in the in a time of crisis um so we had we had some family over and one of my family members had a medical emergency and just kind of seeing them you know just like flip the switch and and jump into action and and how in a time where you know a, a time of crisis where everyone was panicking to to see someone who to see people who are remaining calm and you know working through the situation to a a resolution that was that was really I mean <laughs> it was kind of like a cliched answer but for me that was like a really eye-opening moment and, and you know a lot of times on especially for pre-meds who are watching that this is a question that that is asked sometimes in, in medical school interviews uh well, they, well they'll ask why not a PA or a nurse or something along those lines and, and for me a big part of it was a physician is it's is a physician is part of a medical team and, you know, a team has to work together, but ultimately a, a lot of the major decisions are made by the physician. Um, and for me, I wanted to be the person that people came to for, for the decision making, not necessarily that I wanted to have to consult someone. Like if I, if I was making a medical decision or clinical decision, I wanted to do it on my own terms and making, make sure that I was doing what was best for the patient. And obviously with that, there's a tremendous amount of responsibility. And, and, you know, in line with that is we, we spend a considerable amount of more time training um, as needed. But that, that was a big reason why, why a physician specifically. Okay, great. Great answer. So why specifically did you choose NYIT, College of Osteopathic Medicine? Um, like what, what led you to being attracted to that school? So this is, this is an interesting question because, um, and, and again, you know, uh, for pre-meds who are watching, this is an important point to consider. So when I was applying to medical school, I was very much under the impression that I was like, okay, I'm going to go to an MD school. And, and that was my, you know, like, I, that was, those were the first applications I filled. And then I filled out my DO applications a, f a few months later. Um, and so I, I kind of wasn't really as keen on going to a DO school initially. But for me, when I started going on interviews, actually, it, as it just so happened, NYIT was the school that I liked the most uh, based on all of my interviews. And not only that, but a, a huge part of it also for me was the geographic location. It's 10 minutes from my house. 
um, which to me was, was a really, really big plus. But the number one factor for why I liked it was the, the culture of the school and, and the sense that I got when I, when I came there as a, as a student interviewing. And as, as it turned out, the way that my application cycle went, um, so I, I had applied very late in the cycle and because I had taken my MCAT in July, and so then it kind of pushes everything back. And so I had I was waiting on all of these schools, and and then ultimately um, I was waitlisted to to three schools. And then right about like a few weeks before classes started, I I got into NYIT, and I was really really happy to the phone call. And and the interesting thing, looking back in retrospect, it was like if I had gotten that acceptance, let's say like in October or or November, I may not have necessarily valued it as much. Um, as opposed to, you know, like right at the end, I like realized I really wanted to go to the school and I, you know, I, I ended up getting in and I was really, really happy. And I was in a unique position because when I had started at NYIT, I was on the wait list for an MD school. So there was a possibility that had they taken me off in those last few weeks, I would have had to, I would have left NYIT and go to the MD school. Um, but then, you know, once, <laughs> once I got there for orientation, I I was, you know, I really liked it. And I was like, you know, I, I, I don't want to go. You know what I mean? Yeah. And thankfully, as it, as it worked out, the, the other school didn't accept me. So everything worked out the way it was supposed to. So what extracurriculars were you involved in during undergrad as well as in your first two years of medical school? I know that you mentioned that you had the opportunity to go to Bangladesh and work with the Rohingya refugees. So besides that, of course, if you could expand on that, but other, otherwise, like what other extracurriculars were you involved in? Um, so I guess going in chronological order, in undergrad, my two biggest, well, I guess my three biggest extracurriculars were, um, I worked a part of a organization that um, would visit children in the Child Life Center at Stony Brook University Hospital. It was called Project Sunshine. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of chapters around the country, but Stony Brook's was actually the biggest one of all the college chapters at the time when I was there. I don't know if that's changed since. And that was a absolutely wonderful experience, being able to, to you know, work up close with patients and, and really, especially with children, you know, these, are, these were young, very sick children. And, and it made such a difference for them to have people come and spend some time with them just to like help them forget for a little bit where they are and just feel like a child. Because, you know, no, no child should have to be in that situation at that age, but unfortunately the world we live in isn't so perfect. And I really, really loved that. And I put a lot of time into it. Um, and, and on that organization, I served as a vice president of external affairs my senior year. And it was an extremely fulfilling experience. Uh, another organization I, I worked with was Distressed Children and Infants International, which is a nonprofit organization that raises money for children in Bangladesh to, um, in the villages to go to school and also get minor medical operations like cleft lip surgeries and, and uh, things of that sort. And that was also a really, really incredible experience because, um, you know, for me as a Bangladeshi American, that was, that was very close to my heart. And that's something, that's, that's an organization that I've been involved with for about 16 years now, since I was very young. Uh, and and it, it, was, it was a really, really wonderful experience um, because, you know, it, for that organization, I was, I was uh, president my junior year and then I oversaw uh, as advisor my senior year. And, and, to me, the, the best thing about that was like, you know, being in a, in a leadership position, you really have a chance to inspire people and, and really, you know, kind of instill that same passion in them. And, and you see it and, and it's reflected in their work ethic and it was really nice. Uh, and I was incredibly blessed to work with a really, really good team of students who were very passionate and we did a lot of good in the time that I was there. And my last undergrad experience, I worked in a neurobiology lab where uh, I worked with rodents and you know rats are very misunderstood creatures but they're pretty they're pretty cute yeah. um and what we would do is we would see the effect of deep brain stimulation on um, the effect and inducing dry eye in the rodents and what I would do is I would analyze their r1 and r2 responses on the eeg and I would also run the experiments and, and that was really nice you know kind of working in a in a bench work setting um but for students who are interested in research uh just know that you you have to be very patient because a lot of times it, it takes a few years. So so for me, like I, I had done that. I started that in 2016 up until I graduated. And just six months ago, the paper was published. So it was almost about, you know, almost four years total. So, you know, patience is key. 
And, you know, in, in medical school, the most salient extracurricular I had was absolutely, I was very blessed with the opportunity to visit the Rohingya refugee camp in uh, the summer of 2019. And to see, to see how healthcare works in a completely different setting was, was extremely enlightening. And, and also it taught me a lot about, um, you know, just being grateful for what you have. Because these, these people, like, they, they've obviously been through a lot. And, and to be able to have the blessing of being able to, you know, take part in taking care of them and helping them was a tremendous privilege. And, and, you, and you see, and the most interesting thing was, like, you see people from all over the world coming here uh, to help. And, and so it wasn't just, like, it was in Bangladesh, but you met people from all over who, who would come for six, 12 months at a time and, and, and just work and, and train the people there in proper medical care. And, and it was just such a wonderful experience. Um, and I, I ended up choosing that over doing research that summer. And I have no regrets at all. Four letters that haunt all undergrads are MCAT. So what did you do in order to do well in your MCAT or, um, and to get accepted into medical school in terms of like study strategies and do you have like any overall tips for people who are planning on or in the process of taking the MCAT? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so number one, this, the, these are two big things that I honestly wish in retrospect I had taken more seriously, but first and foremost, it's very easy to get, you know, like lost in the sauce and, and just read the books all day. But ultimately the people who do really well on these exams are the people who do the most questions. And it, the MCAT is essentially like taking four different exams in one day, which is daunting for sure. But the, there's a direct correlation between the number of practice questions and practice tests you do in your school. So that's the first thing. Questions trump reading 99.9 .9 times out of 100. The other thing is it's important to to scale, to, to properly appraise how much time you need to study for the exam because you don't want to spread yourself thin. So personally, one thing that I did that I, I wasn't, you know, in retrospect, I wish I didn't, was I had kind of studied very, you know, um, half-heartedly over an extended period of time. And then towards the end, I really ramped it up. So it was like almost like a year where I was like, you know, casually, like my junior year, I was like casually going through the books and, and things like that. And then towards my, and then I kept having to move my test back. And then eventually um, in July, I, I just buckled down for the last, you know, six weeks. And, and, you know, I got, I got the score I needed to get into school, but in hindsight, I think having a very focused, like, let's say two or three month, maybe even four month period where you can just really, really, really focus on the test and just, you know, put, hundred percent of your effort into it and, and just take it at the end and you know, be done with it. I think that would have been much more beneficial because the thing is when you're studying over an extended period of time, there's so much material to cover that, that uh, you start to forget things uh, if you, right. if you spread it out over too long of a period. And so that's, that's a big part. And, and with that, it's obviously for undergrads, it's very difficult to, to find a two or three month period chunk of time and summers are your really only your, only time and for people who are interested in applying straight through which is what i did it's it's hard because it's going to push your application back a little bit and i was about two or three months behind where i should have been in terms of submitting my application because i took it in the summer um and, and obviously that's a whole other can of worms over if you should take a gap year or not but definitely if it's feasible two or three months of just uninterrupted time no work no class just mcat i think that's the best thing honestly for the people who are in the process of applying to medical school, do you have any advice, tips, or strategies for people that are in the process of applying or planning on applying to medical school? Yeah, so, so the first thing is um, collect your information very early because there's a lot of, you know, uh, bits and pieces to the whole application. You're know, getting letters of recommendation. If your school has committee letters, um, you know, getting your, your application filled, getting your extracurriculars in order, organizing a resume. So it's very, it's definitely beneficial to see if your school has a pre-health office to get in contact with them, just so you know what you need to get everything in order. It's, it's a very long year. And unfortunately, with the way things are, 
it sometimes um, it sometimes may not come to fruition, and sometimes you may have to reapply. But the big thing is that patience is a really big part of it, and also, you know, you have to take it one day at a time. For me, the year that I was applying, uh, it was a lot of waiting. You know what I mean? That was my senior year of college, and you kind of have to make a decision of if I'm going to stress about this every day and and worry about what's going to happen, or just you know, kind of you know, you submit your applications, you you know you you've done what you can and you just you just have to enjoy your life and and wait and see what happens and for me i that was a very big thing for me the year that i was applying i was like i don't want the stress of finding out if i'm going to go to medical school or not to ruin what ended up being the best year of my life and and another thing is that when you're in a position let's say where you're waiting to hear back from schools uh, update letters and letters of intent are very, very powerful things. And it's something that's not really spoken about a lot. But, uh, and again, I can go into detail on that at, at another time, but it's, it's a very, very useful thing when you're waiting to hear back from school and to be persistent. That's something that's not mentioned in great detail when you're applying to medical school, but persistency is a very, very uh, good thing to have during that year. Okay, cool. So you're now a third year medical student. So compared to the first two years, which are more of the in-person class learning type of setting, how does third year and clinicals differ from the first two years of medical school? So the biggest thing is instead of spending, you know, all day in front of a computer at a desk, you are now spending a good chunk of the time in the hospital working with the patients, which is you know, it's it's really exciting because in, in a lot of ways, the first two years of, of medical school feel like an extension of college. Uh, my my sister had described it to me, as, and I think this is probably the most accurate description of, of clinical medical school is like finals week every day. Um, not in terms of stress, but in terms of how much work you're doing. Um, but the, the, hard, the biggest change with, between preclinicals and clinical years is that now you're, you're working full time. I mean, you're not, you know, I mean, you're, work, you're in the hospital working full days, but now you still have to find time to study around that, which is probably the biggest challenge of third year. And, and you adapt pretty quickly. Initially, it's difficult because you go from studying for your boards for, you know, like eight, eight, nine hours a day to, you know, you're just trying to squeeze in time after work. But I think that's that's the biggest change, but it, it's it's very different kind of learning because now you're instead of reading questions and, and reading books, you have actual real life context to to you know help you learn the information. And I think honestly, patients are the best teachers in terms of learning the material you need to be a doctor and you know to pass your boards and everything like that. So like if you have a specific you know path, uh, pathology that you have a lot of difficulty with, if you see a patient with that and you remember how they were treated and how they're managed, you're, you're much more likely to remember it forever. So what does a typical day look like for you when comparing to first or second year compared to now to third year, like a typical day in the life? So preclinicals, it's, it's a little different because there's, I guess you could kind of split it up into when you're studying for boards versus when you're, you know, it's just like a normal day, but I'll, I'll just kind of lump it together for the sake of simplicity. So in preclinicals, for me, a typical day would be like, so, th so before I begin this, a big thing is that um, really quickly, like when you start medical school, you want to make sure that you, you still do things for yourself and that you right. enjoy uh, because, you know, people are like, oh, it's going to become your life. Like, yes and no. Medical school is what you're doing with your life, but it shouldn't necessarily be your entire life. It's a part of your life. And so for me, a big thing was like, I wanted to make sure that I, you know, stayed in, in good health and good shape. And so I would try to go to the gym uh, so regularly, uh, as, you know, as regularly as I did before. And, and so what I would do is like, I'd wake up at seven and I'd go to the gym and then, you know, I'd get ready, shower there, everything. Then I'd go to class at at nine and then from nine to 12, um, well, like this was like more first year schedule but nine to 12, you'd have lectures. And then I'd go to my lectures and I'd take an hour for lunch. Then in the afternoon I'd have labs and then labs would finish at either three or five o'clock depending on the day. And then from 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. I would just stay at school and study. And then 10 p.m. I'd go home, you know, I'd relax for a little bit and then I'd go to sleep and then do the same thing again the next day. Um, in during studying for boards, it was more or less the same, except, you know, I didn't have lectures in the morning. So I just got to get to school at nine and I just tried to, um, 
you know, just work for the whole day from nine to like nine or 10 PM. And then I'd take breaks around, you know, I'd take breaks for lunch and dinner and things like that. Um, but the, the big thing is you want to make sure that you stay on a schedule and, and that's the, you know, I think that's a really key thing is staying on a routine and, and sticking to it. A typical clinical, clinical year day. Um, so since right now I'm on my surgery rotation, that's one of the more intense, uh, time intensive rotations. So, um, so for me, a typical day will start, uh, I wake up at 4.30 and so I have to be at the hospital at 5.30 to pre-round. And to, so pre-rounding is essentially where you, you follow a few patients and you speak to them before the medical team comes and rounds on them so that you can present to the residents and tell them about, you know, um, you know what's going on with the patient and, and you know, what, what you think the next steps should be. And it's, it's more so for the students to, to be educated. And so pre-rounding is 5.30 to 6. And then we go on rounds from about to 6 to 7 or 7.30, depending on how long the cases are and uh depending on how many patients are sorry about that um and then from 7 45 is when the first surgeries start and so we are you sometimes assigned to which cases we want to see and so then we'll go to those cases throughout the day and then depending on how long the cases are how much time there is for the surgeries you We'll spend some time prepping for the surgeries, which is, you know, getting to know the patient, reading through their charts, and then learning the relevant um, pathophysiology related to the surgery and also the procedure of the surgery itself. Because uh, every medical student's favorite um, word that they're terrified of is being pimped. Uh, don't ask me why that's the word that they use, but pimping is essentially where the resident or attending will ask you questions just to see how much you know. And so you want to you wanna make sure that you're prepared for the case and, and a lot of times they're they're impressed um, by you know if you know what's going on and so so you know sometimes you'll be asked questions in the surgery they'll teach you things occasionally depending on where you do your rotation they might even let you do some things during the procedure you know like closing skin with the sutures or or cutting some of the stitches most of the time it's just holding the retractors and and so in between cases you try you know you find time to study um, so. You know, for example, like if I'm waiting outside the OR, I'll, I'll do some like Anki like really quickly on my phone. Or, you know, if, I, if there's like have a bigger chunk of time in between cases, usually I'll, I'll try to study. What ends up happening is I'll like go eat instead, which is probably not the most productive use of time. But, um, you know, you try to get some studying done in between. And then, and then you know, you get home. Sometimes, sometimes I'll get home early or sometimes it's like five or six, depending on the day. And then... So, so for this, you have to be a little more f uh, fluid and flexible with your schedule. So, you know, some days if I have more time, I'll try to go to the gym. Um, and then, you know, you, I'll just study until, let's say, 8 or 9 o'clock, and then I'll just go to sleep. And then weekends we have off. So then, you know, weekends is when you're doing most of your heavy lifting for your study. And, and the big thing is with, with rotations is, like, less is more in the sense where – you have to taper your expectations of how much you're going to get done. Because one thing I've learned recently, like an epiphany that I've had is that it's better to be consistent than, you know, working like eight hours one day, two hours the next day, taking the next day off. So for me, like I'll, for example, every day now I try to do 20 questions. I'll do my Anki reviews and then 50 news. And then I'll try to do a little bit of reading um, in the associated text I need to, learn for the rotation and that's all i'll do for a weekday and then weekends is a different story but but that pretty much like all of that should take me about three to four hours of like dedicated study time so that that's that's pretty reasonable on on most days because you have some time between cases you have some time you know a few minutes here and there you have like two or three hours when you get home um but it's it's very important to to keep in mind like that that you know seeing patients is a big privilege and and it's not the thing about medicine is that it's never about you. It's always about the patient. And, and that's something that's difficult because as a student, you kind of have to be a little bit selfish because you're trying to, to learn. And, and a huge part of third year is that no one is going to teach you and no one's going to go out of their way to, you know, like give you that education. You really have to go for it and you have to ask the attendants, the residents, like, hey, can you teach me this? Can you do this? Can, can I learn how to do this? Can I, can I close stitches? Can I see this patient? It's a lot of your, you have to put yourself out there. And, and for me, like as someone who, like, as you can tell, I'm very chatty, but, but for me, it's very hard to, you know, kind of assert myself like that, but it's, 
very important as a medical student because later as a doctor, you're absolutely going to have to need, you're absolutely going to need that assertiveness. So this is like a very, I think that's probably one of the hard things about third year is that you have to really advocate for yourself to, because your education is as good as you make it at this point in your career. And you really have to go out of your way to like maximize your opportunity. Rounding down to the end of the interview, um, what is one thing that you wish you knew uh, going into medical school that you didn't realize until you started? To be honest, this might be a little uh, controversial, but I think I think one thing that really scared me going into it was like medical students and, and like people in the medical field really like love just like, you know, and, and I'm definitely guilty of this too, but it's like they love complaining about how busy they are. And like, yes, yes, you are busy, but they're like, you know, like I remember I used to meet medical students from Stony Brook Medical School when I was an undergrad at Stony. Like, they'd be like, oh yeah, like you have no life. Like you're just studying all the time. Uh-huh. No, that's, that is not true at all. Like it is, first and foremost, it is a byproduct of how good your habits are. How good your, your work ethic and your habits and how disciplined you are is a direct correlation to like how good your, your life is going to be in medical school. And, and like, if you are very good about budgeting your time then you can absolutely like make time for things that you enjoy like for me like preclinicals like you know i'd take i take top fridays off to like hang out with my friends you know i'd I'd make weekend plans every now and then like i I still had a life you know what i mean like you know like people are like oh you have a life so i wish i had known that it was like it was a lot better than i expected honestly like it was it was a lot of fun like and i i you know looking back on preclinicals i miss it a lot um and, you know, there's always, with every stage of your life, when you move up to it, there's always a bit of apprehension. But I, I wish I had known that it would have been as fun as it was. Like, it, it was really, like, I literally thought I was going to be, like, a, a robot and just have no life. But I made a lot of really good friends. I had a lot of really good memories. Uh, you know, like, you just, like, but it's, like, there's uh, beauty in the struggle. Or, like, the years, I think it was, like, Ralph Waldo. I'm definitely butchering this quote, but it's, like, um, you know, when you look back on your life, the 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 years of struggle will be the most beautiful. And like, I, I really like that a lot because it's, yeah, you're doing something really hard and, and not a lot of people are doing it. And not a lot of people are, um, you know, not a lot of people choose to do that, but it's it's a lot of fun. And I don't think medical school is like, oh, you need to be like a super genius to like do it. Um, because like, it's it's really about how much you're willing to sacrifice and, and how much you're willing to, you know, like come to terms with there's certain things that, that you may not be able to do anymore. Like, you know, like people my age, like I'm 24, like most of my friends, like before COVID, like Saturday, Friday nights, they'd be out, you know, like hanging out with people, like, you know, like having fun. And, and yeah, I had nights like that too, but a lot of Friday nights I was just studying, you know what I mean? And, and I kind of liked it like that, but yeah, I had known that it would be as fun as it was. So is there, for the final question, is there any last advice that you would give to people that are in high school that are interested in going down the pre-med track and eventually going to medical school? Yeah. So the the first thing is um, get, get as much exposure as you can. That's like such a huge thing. And and I know it's kind of like, sounds like very obvious advice, but I've, I've met a lot of people, even in my school where like, they never had any clinical experience before medical school because they were in like a combined program. So they didn't need it. Yeah. But like, if you're interested, you know, shadow a doctor. I think, I think volunteering is great, but ultimately like a lot of times as a volunteer, you're not going to be working that close with the doctor. So if you know right. someone where even, even your, your, um, you know, primary care physician, your, your pediatrician, like ask them if you can shadow them. And, and I think that's like such a good way to get a sense of, of what it's like to be a doctor. Right. Um, so that's the first thing, just to see their day to day. Now, a big thing is like, there's about, as, especially as a high school student, there's about like 15 years between when you get from where you are now to being a doctor. So the next thing to do is to try and see if you can get in contact with like a medical student and, you know, see if, see what their life is like. Uh, I was very fortunate in that I had a very good sense of like what the whole process was like because my elder sister is a physician. But for a lot of people, you know, I mean, it's, it's, if you have a family friend or someone or, or anyone, or even if you, you don't, I'm sure a lot of schools have like outreach programs or like social media pages where you could absolutely just reach out to them and be like, Hey, is there, you know, a Q and a session or something like that? You, the one thing about medical students is like, you know, like they, they love to talk about, you know, like the process and everything, because it's like, you know, a lot of people don't understand it. Um, so that's a, that's a big thing because it is a very big commitment. And, and also like, you know, in the more 
or immediate future. Uh, I mean, I mean, you know, you just finished college. Like the life of a pre-med in college is very different from other majors because it's like yeah. you're, you're kind of have to think like two or three steps ahead into the future to figure it yeah. out uh, what's going to go on. And so, so it's definitely good to get a sense of that because it's like, if you want to like, you know, if you want to go to college, you want to have like, you know, like a, a you know, like a, a really crazy time and stuff like that. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah, there are people who can do that and that are like pre-meds, but the vast majority of us are, you know, live a slightly different life from most undergrads, I would, I would think. Um, so yeah, that's a big thing. Like it's a big commitment, but just get as much exposure as you can. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, Samin, for taking out time on your busy day. You're on surgery rotations. I already know how strenuous that can be. Um, so thank you again for taking out time. Um, and uh, I wish you all the best in your last two years of medical school and we'll stay in touch. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right, man. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome, Salam.